Okay. Um, the beginnings of this talk, I was, you know, surfing the web as you do instead of working. Um, so, um, and um, uh, this was in March, and I found n new things, uh, things I didn't know existed. Uh, and I started thinking this could really affect how I design systems. I, I need to think a bit, a bit more about this. And one way to think more about it is try to, try to make a talk. So I had this talk uh, internally at Factor 10 um, like two weeks ago. And uh, now I have added a few slides and modified things. And this is my second run. See how it goes. So um, who am I? Um, I've been a consultant uh, for 20 years. Uh, seven of those, the last seven have been working at Factor 10. Uh, my title, I don't think we have titles officially, but we usually when we talk to customers, uh, then sometimes I present myself as a coding architect. And uh, I also like programming languages. So I, I know a lot of them, but I don't work in very many, but these days it's mostly uh, Scala and JavaScript, and I think. Okay, so this talk will be a lot about containers and stuff you can do with containers and stuff you can't do with containers. And, and um, in one way, containers are just like virtual machines, right? Um, but they have some important differences that makes it easy for us to use these differences. We can leverage those in uh, the system designs. We do. I mean, key success factors compared to virtual machines. I mean, they are very similar, but uh, they have a lot less overhead. They don't need to load the entire operating system. So they start much quicker. They uh, use a lot less. Uh, memory overhead. So, uh, I mean, you can have a couple of VMs on a big laptop, but you can have hundreds of containers on a, on a laptop. So, I think someone tried to squeeze in uh, like a thousand containers on a Raspberry Pi and just to see it, if it works. And uh, Docker, that's, uh, I have a couple of these uh, Icons telling when stuff was introduced, and this came Docker 1.0 was June 2014, and I think we started using it in 2015, something like that. Uh, so if we do a little graph, uh, it's a log scale, so there's 10 times each, 10 times faster. So a physical machine starts up in like something, b perhaps more than 100 seconds, but less than a thousand seconds. Uh, a VM, well, more than 10, but less than 100. And a container, half a second. Depends on what you put uh, in it, of course, but kind of. So this two orders of magnitude, more uh, or less rather, uh, enables us to do things, but we can travel further down here and, and see where we land and what happens. And uh, one of the components uh, uh, we could do is talk a little bit about serverless, uh, which also uh, sometimes is called functions as a service. So it's kind of you take your, your big service and you just extract one single function. So it's kind of a nano service, I don't know if you could call it that, but it's very, very small. Uh, probably does only one thing. And some people, one example is uh, image decoding, transcoding from JPEGs to uh, PNGs or not, something like that. Video format transcoding. Um, but serverless is a bad, I think, I, I don't like the name serverless because of obviously there's servers involved somewhere. Perhaps not yours, but somewhere. So uh, you just you don't care where. Uh, I think it's better, and it's a, uh, a hilarious joke as well. Um, so the first 
products that started offering this uh, as a service, function as a service, was uh, the, the big Amazon and uh, Azure and, uh, and Google. And do you remember when this when this came out? I ha I have a little calendar for that as well. This was in November, actually. So it's a lot, uh, almost at the same time as Docker containers. And uh, to understand a little bit about what the the potential for using serverless functions, uh, we could take an example for a call center. I mean, typically. Uh, you have a call center with a number of employees. You don't want to have too many employees because if you only have one caller, then you, the other ones are idle and cost money. And but uh, this have you have spare resources, reserved resources, just like on in your servers that you have uh, and services that you have deployed. You have perhaps spare capacity to handle, you know, the anticipated uh, number of users. So this isn't ideal. This costs a lot. You obviously want all of them um, active. And this is not very obvious, but uh, this is the optimal solution. Because as you obviously see, one of them don't have a phone call. So there's one free for taking the next, next call. So you, if this is the situation, you know that you have the optimum number of. Because if you have the last one also in a call, uh, then you don't know if someone was queued up. Okay, you could have a, your phone system could have that, but uh, one one spare is good. But imagine if that was. I mean, why do we design call centers like this uh, with a lot of employees and spare capacity? And why do we design systems that have a lot of spare capacity? Because we we it's adding more people. The HR department they can't just add more people in in a second. Uh, obviously, they t take a lot of time to train and hire and so on. And m even if you're using the cloud, AVS machines typically take a couple of minutes to, to spin up. So imagine if you had a design po possibility for your design center. Imagine if you have uh, some kind of cloning technology available. So you take your uh, best call center employee. Uh, you clone him into a you know an avatar software thingy, uh, and then you just don't activate anyone. You don't pay, no one calling. You don't have any employees. Your call center is empty. No one calls. Then, as soon as someone calls, your cloning technology kicks in, and you have one to handle that. You don't reserve the capacity up front. If there's more callers, you add more of these clones. Or is it clowns? I don't know where it depends on which call center, I guess. Um, but this scales up basically from zero to as many as you want. Because you don't have to manage this, uh, the capacity part of it. Uh, you just provide the, the template for, for the worker. So, I mean, imagine that you had a call center. And then imagine someone invented cloning technology. You wouldn't want the old ver way of reserving you have 200 employees in your call center. You would want to use this because you used the right amount of capacity all the time. So if we go back to serverless, this is typically uh, container based and uh, also start on demand. but. Uh, and also, uh, there's uh, no cluster to provision. But you have this uh, feature of sc the scaling feature that you can scale from zero to infinity without the delays. Uh, but that's kind of a kind of a lie, because if it's container-based, you still have this um, perhaps 500 milliseconds of latency to to kick one more of your containers into action uh, and s for some applications not all but some applications that's too much i mean if you have so used uh, avs lambda or um, google functions or one of these uh, existing frameworks they 
don't just take 500 milliseconds to start up a new instance. Maybe they could take 15 seconds, 30 seconds, depends on luck and uh, scheduling of other things, I guess. So cold starts is a big problem in, in the serverless world, which is why people try to uh, design systems to keep, keep them f the functions warm. You call them even though you don't have anything to convert. You convert the same image over and over just to have some of them running, so you don't have this uh, for the real calls. Um, you don't have the startup latency. So you have you have resources, uh, res uh, read service resources. My argument here uh, is that this affects system design, right? Um, uh, we all have heard, I guess, uh, about the pets versus cattle. Uh, you don't want pets that you have to nurse. You want cattle that you can uh, just replace. But you still have to care in the cattle world. You still have to, you have a Kubernetes cluster, you still have to care about the underlying machines, uh, unless you order the as a service the entire thing, but then it's not cattle anymore, perhaps. So uh, functions as a service often pay per service, pay per use, and, and as, a, as an example, Lambda, they charge uh, per request, and if you run, have a runtime of more than 100, per 100 millisecond runtime. So if you stay under one 100 millisecond runtime, you only get charged for one slot. And that will get uh, something like a cost of $2 per million requests. So it's, it's very, very cheap. If you have a million requests, by if you serve them by having allocated a couple of machines, I mean $2, they, they, uh, that's uh, nothing compared to the fixed machine, reserved machine cost. So it's kind of cheap. Uh, I saw a, a presentation uh, of someone having 400,000 users on a system and they paid a, a Lambda bill uh, of less than $50, I think it was. Okay, just a small, I, don't, I won't go into a lot of detail, but if, if you were to design a system that were going to function as a serverless system, this is one way you could do it. Uh, this is taken directly from Apache OpenWhisk, which is an open uh, source function as a service uh, package, let's call it. So just very, very quick, quickly, what happens is that requests come in, land in a controller, the controller talks to CouchDB just to see if you're authorized to do this, and. Uh, get some other information. Uh, then you also check with the service registry, the console part, to see which of these uh, Docker containers are already running. Uh, so you can address the, the correct one. You, you put it in a queue, and it e eventually executes, which puts the response back into CouchDB, which then could send it back to your uh, the original request gets a response. Uh, so this this part scales. The other part is mostly the same, but this, uh, at least if you want lots of users, you have lots of containers. But this also, you need to have them warm or they're going to be cold start costs. And ca can we do better than this? And there have been several attempts and, and some of them, most of them that I'm going to talk about are rather recent. So one attempt is an uh, Amazon product, open source, called Firecracker. Um, this is, uh, th they, they, they sell it as, what would a virtual machine manager, so it's not a virtual machine, it's a virtual machine manager, if it was designed in from the start for containers and functions. So it takes a lot of shortcuts and it uses the uh, Linux uh, KVM, kernel virtualization functions. And it's, uh, it's really high performance. And this is from uh, November last year. And if we look at where it places itself in this uh, uh, startup competition, it's like 10 times faster than a container to start up, but it, isn't, it doesn't run Linux containers. Uh, it 
it runs a specialized virtual machine. So uh, I'm not sure about uh, how applicable it is for people who only have a lot of the Docker images, but this is uh, Firecracker is what they will. They are going. They are transitioning over to Firecracker for Lambda and Lambda Edge. So they, this is a product they're using it themselves. Yes. Uh, so what they wanted was security and isolation from the virtual machines, but also the resource efficiency of containers. So it's a it's kind of a uh, interesting compromise. Um, 50 milliseconds startup and only five megabytes of overhead per VM. So that's you can run thousands of these on a machine, ob obviously. And it's written in Rust, by the way, and I like Rust, so that's why I mention it. And uh, I'm not the only one who likes Rust. It's been, uh, you know, top uh, most liked language in Stack Overflow service for a couple of years. Uh, let's talk about how this intersects with something called edge edge computing i i think there's some confusion what we mean by edge and one of them is because there's two different ones i think there's one actually on the user's device your browser or uh, your smartphone perhaps or your computer or the edge the one the first hop after your uh, device but not in in the data center much closer to the user so the CDN acts uh, content delivery network. That's CDN. That's close to user. Why do we want that? Because then, if we talk about serverless, we could then talk about region regionless, uh, just as likely. A better name in that context. And why is this interesting? Why would you want to be close to uh, your users? Because of light speed. Light speed is. Uh, unfortunately not infinite so just as an example if the difference if you have servers in uh, Amazon uh, Frankfurt and you have clients in Malmö or in Stockholm the Stockholm ones by laws of physic physics they uh, will have two more milliseconds of latency it, that's just unavoidable and that's one way trip so it's four milliseconds of uh, actual latency so if uh, if you have the like the worst case, you have a user in Sydney and you have deployed to the uh, Amazon uh, East One in Virginia, that's 53 light milliseconds, and so over 100 milliseconds of just unavoidable delay. If if, if it's the best case routing, a really straight cable, which is probably not the case. So this is why would we want to use edge computing? This is a map of um, Cloudflare, which is a content delivery provider. These are their locations. And if you compare that to Amazon's, the red ones are actual uh, Amazon data centers and the green one are planned uh, data centers. So uh, it's not a completely fair comparison, but you see obviously wherever you place yourself on the map, mostly you are going to have a uh, purple dot closer to you so you're going to be closer to one of these locations the users i mean you could have a 50 user internal uh, internet app then you don't care about this obviously but if you have users around the world you could be interested to talk about this so how do we benefit from this and one way is a product that has been around a little bit uh one year or so called cloud flare workers so Cloudflare have already uh, a, a content delivery network for serving your static JS files and uh, images and whatnot. Uh, but now they have workers, which is basically your serv service workers that can run in your browser, but they run in uh, at, at their edge locations instead. And uh, they're based on, um, on Chromium browser. Uh, the V8 engines isolate, and an isolated, watch, I, I think it's fair to say that that's what's in each tab is a single isolate so it's a copy of the runtime that isolated from the others but share some logic i guess so it's javascript at the edge and if you look at where this places itself on the startup competition it's 
it only takes about five milliseconds to start up on a new isolate and load something in it. So it's it's ten times faster as well. And what uh, you have five milliseconds to start up, and only three megabytes of overhead, so it's a little bit smaller than the that one. Uh, so this is uh, uh, s there from a number from their uh, marketing, so a grain of salt, I guess. But uh, half of their responses is less than 13, uh, is 13 milliseconds or, or faster. So that's, I mean, if you're talking about the Sydney, Virginia case, that's, I mean, way, way faster than even halfway to. So if you could place uh, one of your the workers near your users, you could shave off, depending on where they are, ob obviously, and where you have deployed your service, but you can shave off hundreds of milliseconds in the best case, and a couple of milliseconds otherwise. So it's uh, they claim it's much faster than Lambda and uh, Lambda at Edge. And I'm going to just mention Lambda at Edge briefly. This is... Uh, basically a free feature of CloudFront, which is their, their li content delivery network. And uh, what it enables you is to run Node.js functions whenever there's a CloudFront event, such as an incoming request. And that's uh, like two years old now. I'm not going to, uh, I don't have any numbers for this, but it's, uh, as they say, it's uh, Cloudflare at least cl claim their workers are faster than this. Can we do better than this, uh, running JavaScript at Edge? Well, if we start looking at something called WebAssembly, maybe we can. And WebAssembly um, was standardized and uh, delivered to the major browsers in uh, late 2017. Um, and it's, it's basically because JavaScript was never designed to be a compiled target, yet we have many languages that, that compile down to JavaScript. But if you design, think about this problem and design stuff for actually being a compiled target, which is what as WebAssembly is, you, you, I'm not expecting people to actually try to program anything in WebAssembly, but it's a compiled target. So for C++, C and Rust at the moment is very well supported because those ha don't have any runtimes. Uh, but Anything with a runtime, like Python or uh, .NET or, or Java, uh, you'd have to also port over your uh, virtual machine to, to WebAssembly. But th th there's uh, work doing that as well. So uh, for those interested in compilers, a lot of languages use LLVM. And LLVM 8, uh, which is released in March, uh, it's no longer experimental, so it's easier for compilers and languages to target this now. So, what did Cal Cloudflare do? Now, they started allowing people to use Wasm instead of just JavaScript, and this was in March. Because uh, Chromium is one of the supported browsers that run WebAssembly, so... Uh, they developed a tool called Wrangler. It's a command line tool that just enables you to write Rust code in a specific way and then deploy that as I compile it to WebAssembly and deploy it to a cloud for worker somewhere. And one thing that that doesn't have, but which is coming as well now, is something called WASI, which is WebAssembly system interface. Why is this important? Well, uh, Lynn Clark, who is a uh, principal engineer at uh, Mozilla, she um, is, uh, does great web comics and uh, information about, among other things, WebAssembly. And uh, in March, they announced uh, WASI, which is running uh, WebAssembly stuff, not only in a browser, but anywhere. Because what is the problem with running it in a browser? Because then you have uh, a lot of overhead if you want to use it for something that isn't browser related. So how, how important is that? Is this something we should care about? And 
let's see what uh, the founder of Docker said about this announcement. Solomon Hike is one of the co-founders of Docker. He said something like, I wouldn't have created Docker if that was available when I needed it. So uh, it's really important, he thinks. Uh, WebAssembly on the server, because what WebAssembly does is like leveling the playing field. As long as you can compile down to WebAssembly, then you can run in a lot more places especially if the system interface is there, because what the, the compromise you had earlier was some kind of POSIX uh, emulation layer, if you have heard of mscript and, and asm.js and so on. They uh, try to emulate and, com and comp complete uh, POSIX system, Unix-like system with file access and uh, sockets and whatnot. And that's just way overcomplicated when you don't need those things. So, uh, another tweet from Solomon. Uh, will it replace Docker? No, it won't. But he envisions something like uh, Wasm containers that will uh, that will be uh, available. So, what is Wasm container? That's not a thing. I'm just uh, making that up uh, or based on these slides. But um, it could be a thing. It's what I'm meaning is that. Sure, you can have Wasm plus the system interface that allows you to open, get that data or send data and so on. Um, but no one has done the thing that Docker did for, I mean, the, con the tech behind Docker was available for a long time, but it was hard to use and uh, not packaged well. But Docker really succeeded in packaging that into something with uh, binary format for images and uh, distribution of the images and uh, starting and stopping containers and management and so on. So uh, Docker containers aren't just the tech, because that was available for years before Docker came. So the Wasm containers, the, this, the tech is there now. Someone will uh, inevitably make something like Docker for Wasm containers, or even Docker will uh, add support for it. So what if you know about uh, Wasm and Vasi, what would you do if you had knowledge of that? Well. A company called Fastly, they develop a, a tool called Lucet, and Fastly is another is a comp competitor to uh, Cloudflare, so it's another content delivery network provider. So they built a tool called Lucet, and that's their engine for uh, their Terrarium engine, which is like uh, Cloudflare workers, but their version of that. And uh, it would this was designed to handle every request fastly handles, which is a lot. And they wanted to uh, be able to run tens of thousands of requests per second in a single process using Wasm containers. And to design this, it required a dramatically lower footprint than using something like uh, um, Chromium V8 isolates. So where do we land on this? Uh, it was also in March, by the way. Where do we land our, our little uh, speed competition? Way lower, a couple of hundred of milli uh, microseconds. So, uh, and I have even, they have the even better marketing mar material, but I, I didn't uh, want to over exaggerate. Um, but for loading a, a, a container in their runtime from from disk, so it's not including a lot of uh, overhead for for a lot of management around it. But so it's, it starts up really fast if you have it uh, at hand, at least. So it's a Vasi runtime. So it's not running in the browser. It runs Wasm Wasm models modules uh, in a in another application. So it's only five kilobytes of overhead for each invocation of uh, lo loading another module, what's the module? And this uh, loses is actually kind of a compiler. It takes a um, web assembly module and just r r creates native code out of it. But it's still a f uh, just like you can have your uh, JavaScript or your uh, JVM code actually translated beyond your intermediate code down to machine code. This is what they do as well. <coughs> uh, 
It's also written in Rust, by the way. Um, so what if we merge all, all these things and talk about user edge on the device? Uh, obviously, you don't have you, you can't control what the user have the capacity of their machines. Um, and I mean, imagine running a Docker container on your phone. I don't think anyone would want that to happen. So, and also you don't want to run native code, which you would be, I mean, for efficiency reasons, something called to compile down to assembly code and just run it. Yeah, that's small and fast, great. But it's untrusted and unsafe, so you don't really want that either. But if you have WASM containers and you run it in one of these uh, VASI sandboxes, then you can just control everything about it. Th it doesn't have direct access to the file system. You just hand it capabilities. You can read this file. You can't read any other file. This is the file you want, the, the user data file, whatever. Uh, so it's sandboxed, even though it could be compiled to native code. So, so this is something that wasn't possible with Docker, but is now. So I see a lot of different uses for, for uh, awesome containers. Um, perhaps you have any ideas? I have, uh, I have a few, but... If you have something that starts up, this is the premise of the talk, basically. If you have something that starts up in microseconds, at least, uh, say, half a millisecond, say, if you don't, and you, you can run it on demand, and it doesn't take a lot of memory, and you could... Uh, so it's not the startup that you don't have to worry about keeping things warm anymore. Yes, you can use it anywhere. So one of the uses that I also found on uh, on Twitter uh, was Kelly Summers. Uh, she thinks that, well, you could use it as a stored procedure thing in a database. Then you can write your stored procedures in whatever language that supports compiling down to WebAssembly, and you would uh, have good performance, and uh, you don't have to uh, write it in transact SQL or whatever kind of language the database has. Uh, and she references the Fastly uh, Lucid announcement there in the tweet. But uh, if you look at your typical like uh, Kubernetes deployment, I mean, you have a couple of machines, depending on uh, obviously the expected loads, but uh, load. But if you have a couple of machines and you uh, have a couple of, uh, they are reserved for running, you have started your services. Um, they're waiting for requests, you route them to the correct endpoint. But uh, imagine if you, you don't have to have that. You just have uh, one way of obviously could be that uh, you have the reserved uh, machine, but you don't have anything running until an actual request come in. Then you start up something that could handle that. And uh, also, we must uh, also remember that startup time isn't the only thing that is a factor of of course, because what if your very close to the user uh, thingy needs to connect to Virginia for to, to get a database record? But then you're back to your old solution. But perhaps you can have that uh, as a st stored locally somewhere, and you uh, so it's it, uh, just a hit the first time you actually get that request from the user, then. As long as they don't move around, that um, data center has the my uh, record, the customer record for for my purchases and whatnot. So uh, what I was saying is basically that yes, startup is important, but there's other latencies. The the, the state hydration part is also going to be important. That that you have to design something there as well. This doesn't solve every every problem, unfortunately. So just as a as a little bit of a quick run through of the landscape, this is, there are more alternatives out there, but this is a couple of serverless thingies or uh, with container tech. So the OpenWhisk one is based on Kubernetes and Docker, open source. The first ones, 
Lucid is also open source and runs Wasm with a uh, system interface. Firecracker is also open and it was they are going to use it to run the Lambda functions. Uh, OpenFast is also uh, Docker based and just runs uh, any container you have with a HTTP interface. Cloudflare Workers, just uh, JavaScript or Wasm. Lambda runs a couple of languages. And Cloud, cloud Functions runs also a couple of languages. And Azure Functions also a couple of languages. And they're mostly closed source. You can't really, really use them for yourself. But these these parts, but I mean, but some of these are not, these are not, these are more equal because they are uh, the engines. You could design something around those. Uh, OpenFast and OpenWhisk are more of the whole package, uh, the um, scheduling of uh, containers and so on. Uh, so Firecracker is the engine for Lambda, Lucis is the engine for Terrarium, uh, Firecracker, uh, sorry, uh, V8 is the run, run time environment for, for Cloud for Workers, basically. But uh, also I want to mention that we have, we, we went down to 150 microseconds. I mean, if, that's fine, but if we look at down at the sc scale down at one nanosecond, I mean, that's basically what uh, CPU add instruction takes. I mean, one gigahertz is one nanosecond. <laughs> Negative. Uh, you mean, uh, yeah, depend on AI perhaps can do that. Uh, you anticipate which button you were going to click. So it's already uh, buys the bike for you before you wanted it. I don't know. Yeah, so I always wanted to say that I mean we are over a couple of magnitudes. I mean one, two, three, four, five magnitudes over. I mean a very, 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 very small basic machine code function. So we're still we're still not there. But what we what do we get? We get uh, isolation. We get um, s the, the sandboxing with and the, this rather fast startup time and uh, if just someone adds the packaging up on top of this I'm, th I'm thinking this is going to be really interesting and I'm also thinking that um, uh, you could this could and should def uh, affect your system design I mean the reserved resources is like the call center you have with 200 employees just in case uh, perhaps you can do it some in another way. Yeah, and I to to borrow a phrase from uh, Stephen Fry. If you have been, thanks for listening.